Ladies and gentlemen, our first session begins with the Union Minister, Mr. Piyush Goyal. I'd like to invite Mr. Piyush Goyal, the Union Minister for Commerce and Industry, Consumer Affairs and Food and Public Distribution, and Textiles, to come up for a conversation on the trade capital with the Editor-in-Chief, Arnab Goswami, and our Senior Executive Editor, Abhishek Kapoor. Ladies and gentlemen, with a prolific three-decade-long career in politics, Mr. Piyush Goyal has established himself as a problem solver par excellence. With Mr. Piyush Goyal at the helm, India has managed to touch an all-time high of $750 billion in exports, witnessed a 35% jump from the challenging pandemic year of 2021. Now, as the Union Minister of Commerce and Industry, Consumer Affairs and Food and Public Distribution and Textiles, Mr. Goyal is charting out a path for India's transformation by closing free trade agreements with a diverse set of nations. On your screens, you'll be able to see now an image of the Union Minister inking the historic economic cooperation and trade agreement with Australia. And of course, there are many more such agreements to follow as India transforms into a pivotal trade hub. So it's over to Arnab and Abhishek to steer that conversation. Thank you, Rini. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, Abhishek and I were just saying, Mr. Goel, that we really miss your high energy performances on political debates nowadays. Don't we all? Yeah? Yeah, Shazad? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have to compensate and wake us all up this morning. But it's great to see you, Piyush. Great thank to you, see you. Thank you, Arnab, and congratulations for this wonderful journey of six years. Uh, you forgot uh, one element of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vishwas, you, your prayas. We must compliment you for all the dedicated effort you put in to bring this channel to life. You were almost a startup six years ago. I remember those days struggling uh, with all the difficulties and of course your tryst with the government hounding you also in my home city. Yes. But you stood your ground and I must compliment you for Thank you. this journey of transformation. It's absolutely so kind of you to say that. You've always been most encouraging, uh, Mr. Goel, and I value our friendship. Uh, this theme of the summit this year, uh, Mr. Goel, is uh, the time of transformation. I think everyone here, the large number of people who have come here today who want to get as close a glimpse as possible, Mr. Goel, to what this transformation really means in terms of not where we will reach, but what's going on the ground right now. So my first question is a little generic. Uh, when you interacted with us at the Economic Summit in 2022, you had said that the next 25 years will be defined as the golden period of India. Now it is established that this growth period, it is without a doubt, but what I'm not clear about, what we don't know yet, what is the pace of the transformation? Uh, is, are we leapfrogging? Are we on the edge of hockey stick growth? Or are we looking at a sustainable, slow-paced, long-term growth? Mr. Goel. I think never get attracted by all these fancy words of hockey stick and uh, V and W and U. Those are not the elements that will ultimately define the success story of a nation. I think this is one country which has the power to multiply progress to grow very rapidly through the sheer strength of the capability that I see before me, the 140 crore Indians, with a commitment to make a difference not only to India, but to the world. Vasudeva Kutumbakam is our very theme at the G20. I'll just give you a little heads up on why I believe there's going to be a transformational journey ahead of us. 
There was a time not too far back in history where we had large numbers of Indians struggling for the basic needs like roti, kapda, and makan. Hindi movies were made with Manoj Kumar uh, articulating the problems of a common man. You had a situation where so many of our Indian families would get down into literally debt for the rest of their life if somebody in their family fell ill and needed medical treatment. The country did not have the basic amenities, the needs of life, drinking water at home, electricity, digital connectivity was a dream or only for those who are privileged in some of the major cities. What Prime Minister Modi has focused on in the last nine years and why I believe these nine years have been a transformational journey for all of India, not for a select set of, in your words, Lutians, Delhi, but for the entire country, is the fact that in the worst of situations, we did not have a single person who had to sleep hungry at night during the lockout, lo lockdown and COVID. Today, the entire country has the basic needs of life, roti, kapra, makan, swast, shiksha, digital connectivity, bijli, pani. Pani is an ongoing process. The Jal Jeevan mission would be taking water to every home in the next two years. It's already crossed uh, nine or 10 crore uh, homes who have been given water connections through a tap for the first time in their life. All of these are basic needs, once fulfilled, bring in the hunger in the human being, bring in that aspiration, hunger not as in food hunger, the aspiration for a better quality of life. And I think that has been the story of India over the last nine years. All the basic needs being taken care of so that today's youth connected with the rest of the world with smartphones, nearly 800 million people having smartphones and internet connectivity with uh, electricity and all the ingredients to be able to aspire for what the world has. And that aspiration, that, that uh, fire in the belly is what Prime Minister Modi has been able to create over the last nine years. Every youth today wants a better future for him and his family, him and her uh, and their families. Every girl child today with education wants to contribute to the country's growth. We have about 18% women participating in the national GDP. I see that growing to upwards of 50-55% in the next few years. And therefore, I see before me very clearly an India which will be not less than 35, 40 trillion dollar economy with inclusive growth around the country by 2047. And I can give you a simple uh, so, so, data point. Yeah, so, Last 25 years, with all the difficulties that each one of us have experienced and seen, with all the problems, the country was able to grow 10x from sure, 350 sure. to 3.5 trillion. Sure. Even on a business as usual case, yeah. we would become a 35 trillion. Correct. So Given just, the transformation changes, very curious on we could look at going beyond 40. Sure. I'm very curious on the numbers, you, because you also said that we'll become the third largest economy by 2027. And you've said 38 trillion economy by 2047, which means that we need to surpass Germany and Japan, which are already, Abhishek, what, $4.9 trillion yeah, economies. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that, are you saying, because my question was on pace of growth, a lot of people who run businesses are working, what, just want to understand, are you saying we can achieve that in the next two years? Well, I, I'll tell you why we can achieve that. Yes. You look at a recent study that Bloomberg did, and Bloomberg came out with a, uh, with a very clear picture of what's happening in the world. While well, almost every country has a high probability of recession in the coming years, uh, all of Europe is between 50-55%. UK, I think, was at 75% possibility of recession. Where was India? Zero. Zero, Zero. probability of a recession in India. <laughs> look, at, look at the fact that our fundamentals of the economy today are exceptionally strong. Strong foreign exchange reserves, inflation under check. 
You remember the days we used to debate on television and you were into your aggressive best when there was 11-12% inflation in India and you would have the then Congress government almost writing it off as, oh, so what? It's bound to be there for a developing nation. It's another matter that the then finance minister blames the other finance minister before him and who's no more here to defend himself. On television, on a public stage, it's so sad that to a person who's no more uh, there to defend himself is being blamed for that 11-12% uh, inflation and the Congress regime. For Prime Minister Modi, it's the whole of the government. We are one government. We are all collectively responsible. And our actions speak for themselves. Every action is coordinated. Every action results in a benefit for the common man. All the work that we are doing, be it free trade agreements for that matter. Yeah. The ultimate objective is a better life for the people of India, jobs for our people, new opportunities. And I think today's youth is now energized, is now empowered to really contribute to India's growth story. Right. Abhishek. Okay, so, so since you mentioned that we were a startup in 2017, I can tell you we are a startup even now in terms of our spirit, you know. And uh, Ornob is transforming us uh, every day. Sometimes we are transmogrifying also. And uh, thank you. <laughs> what is that? Transmogrify. <laughs> and uh, we'll have a that, chat after the event. You know, every day you are thinking of doing something. We shake the boss is always right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but we are, we are we are transmogrifying. 20 years of friendship <laughs> just went down in the drain. <laughs> no, but but but. So serious note, tough. So when you say 35, 40 trillion dollar economy, uh, what's the nuts and bolts? What's really happening? For example, 2047, is rupee going to be the currency, global currency? If yes, what are we doing now to make uh, the credibility of rupee durable for that long and yeah, beginning now? Look and at how many countries would be trading in rupee? How many banks? Things like that. Also, uh, like I said, we are a startup. I see, you said, whole of the government approach. Is some midnight burning of oil happening to make sure that we see that, that happening in, over the next 20 years? Well, when and what kind of midnight burning? Knowing the Modi government, you should know that midnight is too early. Midnight is the time we only leave the office with uh, files in our hand to still work after that. So Prime Minister Modi has been clear from day one. Aap jitna kaam karoge, main ek ghanta usse jada karunga. And he encourages us to actually you spend every moment of our time in contributing and giving back to society. I remember once asking him, Ke, Pradhan Mantri Ji, aap chutti kyu nahi lete? Kabhi to chutti le lije. He says, Mujhe janta ne chutti lene ke liye Pradhan Mantri nahi bana hai. Ek mokha mila, ek afsar diya hai. Us afsar ko kaise hum istamal karein? Jisse jada se jada logon ka laab ho sake, jada se jada logon tak हमारे सब कार्यक्रम पहुंच सके मुझे तो उसकी चिंता लगी रहती है एंड आई टेल यू आई रिमेंबर इन 2014 इन द फर्स्ट और सेकंड इंटरेक्शन व्हाट वाज इस गाइडेंस जितेंद्र सिंह जी इस हियर ही विल रिकॉल दैट ही एंड ही इस वर्किंग राइट इन द प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स ऑफिस हिस गाइडेंस वर बेसिकली टू � the West and South cannot have the privilege of being growth engines and the East or the Northeast or the Northern parts of India cannot remain deprived of development. And you see that in his actions. The way he has focused on the development of the Eastern states, the Northeastern states, the way he's looking at India as one country. So when he says power for all, he doesn't discriminate. There's no bhed bhav. Power for all means power for all. It will not be that one community or one set of people will get power. When he says everybody gets a tap uh, water from their tap, it's for everybody. When he talks of housing, he talks that everybody should have a right to a proper home, digital connectivity. Each one of his programs is, is taken up in a saturation mode and particularly focus being on the less developed regions. Second thing he told us was, don't look at elections. Elections will come and go. Focus your energies on outcomes. Get, get really good uh, results of the work that you're doing. Sometimes the work that you're doing may not be electorally very prudent, mm. 
but you don't bother about that focus sure. on what is good for the people of india and they will respond for what is good for them ye janta badi samajhdar hai so, sab kuch samajh so is becoming a primarily manufacturing economy one of those outcomes that you're looking for i mean our jump from an agrarian to a services tertiary sector based economy broke the iron laws of development economics mr goel just broke it so are we setting a goal that we want do we want to continue to bank on services for growth or do we want to become primarily a manufacturing driven economy i think there's a role for each of the segments of the economy be it uh, agriculture be it manufacturing be it services just for a moment imagine if our annadatas our farmers hadn't contributed so significantly to our food security could we have overcome this very severe covid crisis the once in a century pandemic the fact that uh, food corporation of india continued to procure uh, food grains and our farmers did us proud with the huge production of food uh, food products that they do we were able to overcome covid without anybody ever having to face starvation i'm told during the spanish flu 100 years ago more people in india died because of starvation than by the spanish flu itself we were able to of course prime minister modi came up with the pradhan mantri garib kalyan an yojana he also by then thanks to his technological bent of mind had introduced one nation one ration card so that throughout the country now a person eligible for free food grains and we have 800 million people 80 crore people getting free food grains they can walk into any of the 500000 fair price shops any one of them and they don't even need a ration card they are thumb impression and their aadhar number is their identity and they can take whatever food grain they want they can take part of it as a migrant labor in surat or uh, hyderabad and the rest in their home town in odisha or west bengal the fact that he has prepared the foundation of a strong economy is what held us in good stead during covid so i think agriculture has a huge contribution to make for any future security that the nation is preparing for manufacturing is something that we lost out on particularly after the relations that were created by the then government between china and india and encouraged in the 2004 to 14 period you will i mean a data point for you to dwell upon india's imports from china were probably 2 or 3 billion dollars around 2004 when the congress came into government i don't know what they signed up in their agreements uh, with the chinese communist party but it resulted in our imports from china going up many fold to over 50 55 billion dollars in a short span of time we have never seen this kind of an increase in imports from any part of the world and most of this was substandard low cost goods being pushed into india which killed indian manufacturing which actually was at predatory pricing which was goods which may have looked good but were harmful for india we recently did the action on the toys we found that one third of the toys that came in were actually harmful for the kids for their safety security and these type of goods in a way damaged the very firmament of india's manufacturing base we are now trying to overcome that we are bringing in quality control orders we are introducing awareness amongst the people of india that ye chhota sa jo ek 10 50 paise ek rupya bachane ke chakkar mein hum bharat ki arthyavastha ko kitna damage kar how many lakhs and crores of our young boys and girls lose out because of these indiscriminate imports and that and the fact that india opened its doors for all of these products actually killed indian manufacturing to the extent that when we go out there to try and get indian manufacturers to invest we really had a difficulty in the first 3 or 4 years people were so used to low cost at times i actually asked the uh, chinese uh, commerce minister during the rcep negotiations that look my manufacturing costs of this glass is more than the cost at which it comes landed to india delivered marketed and sold 
How the hell do you do it? Can you, can you share some data points? He says, no, no, we can't give you any data about how we do our business practice. Completely irregular and in a way breaking will, all the rules will, of trust. Will you correct this imbalance? Sorry? Will you correct this imbalance? We that are you've inherited for vis -vis example, China. one of the first steps India took, and it was a very bold step, was walk out of RCEP the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Correct. that the Manmohan Singh well government done, well had put us into. You know, India was never a part of RCEP. The RCEP was without India. There were 15 other nations. Our government had a meeting at the highest level and decided to get into the RCEP negotiation, despite the fact we already had free trade agreement with all the 10 ASEAN countries, with Japan, with Korea. Correct. We, could, we were on the verge of signing up with Australia at that point of time in 12, 2011 or 12 when we joined RCEP. We, New Zealand was a very small trading partner, two, three hundred million dollars of trade. So effectively, the Manmohan Singh government, Congress government, the government led by the, uh, by the Gandhi family, I mean, they were monitoring and remote controlling the whole government. That government pushed India into RCEP, because of which we would effectively have been doing a free trade agreement with China. Well, how would that have been for India? Absolutely. How would that have hurt India? Zero duty imports coming in from China for the rest of our life. We could not have competed in manufacturing. Manufacturing could have been dead if India had joined RCEP thanks to what was started by the Congress Party. So since walking out on all the F, you, you're closing all these FTOs after walking out of RCEP, and you're talking to Russia, UK, uh, EU, Canada, GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council. You, you, apparently, you wake Israel, up every morning. Peru you, wants you, to have a, you have a you have a target of one FTA a week. Well, tomorrow I have four ministers from Europe coming to India. Yeah, uh, the EFTA, European Free Trade Agreement Zone, Free Trade Area Zone. Incidentally, the fact that all of the countries in the world today are approaching India. I had about 16, 17 trade ministers visit India only in the month of March, only in one month. The British feel you're a very tough negotiator. Before I come to that, I want to let, I want to thank the people of India. All of this enthusiasm, all of this excitement, all of this desire to work with India has three elements in it. First and foremost, it is you, the people of India, the 140 crore Indians, with huge talent, huge management skills, with huge demand and appetite for good quality goods and services. They respect the huge market opportunity from India, for the rest of the world, and for India, for the people of India, which is exciting the world to come and work with India. So thank you very much, all the people of India, all the youth of India, due to whom we are able to get so much excitement about India. Second is the fact that we have a decisive leadership, the fact that you gave us two terms of an absolute majority government, because of which they see political stability, they see in Prime Minister Modi, in the words of the Italian Prime Minister, the most loved leader in the world. Recently, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is on record. The way she has articulated her admiration for Prime Minister Modi, for his knowledge, for his... She had a conversation with him which revolved all around quantum computing, artificial intelligence and technology. And she was literally taken aback with the depth of knowledge that the Prime Minister had on these very, very critical and complicated issues. So what I'm trying to say is the world today is looking at a leader who they look upon not only as a leader of India, but a leader of the world. How many, I was in Italy last two, two weeks back. The Italian Deputy Prime Minister tells me the only person who can solve this war and the conflict going on is Prime Minister Modi. That's the level of confidence and expectations in our leadership. And the third is the strength of our democracy. We are the mother of democracy. We had democracy, the rule of law, we had the power of the people of India being reflected in government, in decisions, for thousands of years. It's unfortunate that we got into the colonial mindset over the last two, three hundred years. And which is why when the Prime Minister speaks about the Panch Pran, 
the fact that collectively with a sense of duty and maintaining the unity and integrity of India, each one of us will unshackle from our mind the colonial mindset that we've had, unfortunately, go back to our roots, our traditions, our history, our rich culture, our heritage, and make India a developed nation by 2047. Eminently doable. It will happen. There's absolutely no power on earth that can stop this from happening. The quintessential reporter in me, looking for some headline hunting, you know, so, uh, this free trade agreements that you are uh, on a signing spree with talks on with the UK as well. Uh, the, if they're using this Khalistani issue as a foreign policy tool, why don't we get back? Well, first of all, let me clarify, there's no signing spree. India does deals on its terms on what is good for the people of India, what is good for business in India, and what is good for our long term. So the signing spree is the measure Point of people one. wanting to do trade with us. Point two. Every deal stands on its own merits. Every free trade agreement one has to study, one actually has to crystal gaze 20 years, 30 years, 50 years into the future. What is the impact of each of the elements? So when we talk to UAE or Australia, I literally have to see where that country is going and where I will fit into the matrix for the good of India, and they have to protect their interests. No agreement. And okay. We all as businessmen know it has to be a win-win for both. So I assure you, each agreement will be done for India's interests. There are, of course, political issues we have with many countries. The political issues are taken care of by the respective uh, dialogue, diplomacy, yeah. and in, in the correct fashion in which political diplomacy has to be done. But uh, economic diplomacy demands that India, if we want to become a developed nation, should engage, yeah. should trade, should do business with like-minded countries, with democracies, with powerful economies, with strong economies, with big purchasing power. Yeah. I mean, if you go to your competitors and open your market, you're going to be out of business. Last, but when you open your markets for countries who are not your competitors, but who, com who are complementing your, your skills, I think that's where the maximum benefit comes to. Last you. quick question, Mr. Goel on balancing global interests. You are having a free trade agreement with the British and I don't have any problems seeing the British wins a little bit. You can, you can trouble them as much as you want. We are quite enjoying it. <laughs> when the British come and say that, you know, your government's giving us a tough time, it's, it's like, it's a good feeling. The question is, you're also talking to Russia on FTA while simultaneously being in talks with the UK. This is marvelous. This, how does one do this balancing of global interests? Well, Finally. first of all, I am not trying to make anybody cringe or make anybody feel bad. Uh, I think trade diplomacy involves a lot of give and take and a lot of negotiations. So there is, I can, I can tell you, even if Arnab Goswami wants it and wants a headline, he's not going to get from me a thing that I'm, we are creating a problem for UK. <laughs> There's nothing of that sort. Each country protects its interests. We are protecting our interests. They are protecting their interests. So let me assure you that it's not a one-upmanship. It's not some fence fight or a sword fight that we are in engaged in. We are engaged in mature discussions, which are in the best interests of both countries. And ultimately, if we don't see any good in it, we wouldn't have been there in the first place. We see some merit, which is why we are engaging with them. We see there's a potential... Uh, demand for goods, for services, and an opportunity for lakhs and crores of our youth to get work opportunity, job opportunity, our startups to flourish, investment to flow into India. It's a whole package that you are working on. As regards balancing, I think Prime Minister Modi has made it very clear. We do not believe this is an era of war. We believe conflicts have to be resolved through dialogue, through diplomacy, at the earliest. And we would urge all the countries to actually sit down, talk to each other, and find solutions. After all, even in the peak of the Ukraine war, European countries did buy gas from them. They did buy their energy requirement, food, grain, fertilizer. So I think everybody is very practical. Everybody does what is suitable for them, manages their own economy and national interests, and India is doing the same. We are managing our national interests in the interests of 140 crore Indians and their future.
Well, Mr. Goel, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that session. And do keep capitalizing on all, all these changes. Thank you.